this winter, because Europe doesn't have reliable energy because they've decommissioned it um, in favor of unreliable solar and wind, when people start to freeze in their homes and or they can't afford food because their energy costs are too high, they're going to vote these politicians out. So this virtue signaling, it just, it just fundamentally can't work because people need energy. Listen, Kathy Wood has been among the biggest destroyers of capital we've ever seen. Listen, there was, uh, I want to read my notes here. There was a uh, robotics engineer who was quoted um, in the Associated Press. He said the, the AI day from Tesla was, quote, a scam. So this is another overpromise, underdeliver, or what some would say, quite frankly, lie. Some people have accused Elon Musk of being a pathological liar. I'm not going to accuse him of that, but this is a car company. And people say, well, no, it's a software company. That's also ludicrous. They don't lead in uh, technology. They lag. They're very last. And with respect to their batteries, you know, everything they said at Battery Day was a sham, pretty much. Yeah, look, I think FSD is among the biggest deceptions slash, um, I don't want to, I don't know, one of the biggest deceptions in corporate history. Our, our working assumption is that Tesla is above all laws and they can do whatever they want. So I think the stock's going to come, come under tremendous pressure. In this video, everyone's favorite Tesla bear and or method actor. Wait, why did, excuse me, hello. Why did we write method actor on our, oh, I'm not meant to explain that because if I did, I might, oh, okay, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Sorry, producer was just in my ear, just needed to clarify something. Gordon Johnson shares some thoughts and opinions about Kathy Wood, destroyer of capital, Elon Musk, Tesla, the bot, the battery day sham, <laughs> the FSD lie, Tesla being above the law, and actually also stunningly says some things I completely and utterly agree with. This is gonna be good. And before we get into it, if you wanna instantly unlock over 100 exclusive videos, plus my 10 year Tesla stock price targets and loads of other perks, including optional access to my Tesla valuation model, join our growing community of thousands of supporters on Patreon with the link in the pinned comment. You can also pick up some Tesla, Elon, and investment themed merch in the merch store. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you are sitting the f down for this because Gordon Johnson is about to say something that I actually agree with almost entirely. This winter, because Europe doesn't have reliable energy because they've decommissioned it um, in favor of unreliable solar and wind, when people start to freeze in their homes and or they can't afford food because their energy costs are too high, they're going to vote these politicians out. So this virtue signaling, it just, it just fundamentally can't work because people need energy. He's right. Like, absolutely right. You see... For some strange reason, I'm not sure exactly what's going on and why, but at some point, Germany in particular decided that signaling virtue was a lot more important than actually thinking and doing things that make sense. Irrationally spreading fear, uncertainty and doubt around the safety, reliability and utility of nuclear energy. Next minute, all the dumb people who don't like to think for themselves, decommission our nuclear power plants, nothing could possibly go wrong. Next minute, war in Ukraine. Next minute, energy prices through the f***ing roof. Why? Signaling virtue from top to bottom. Bunch of morons in the mainstream, the public, the general public. Oh, what do I need to think? What do I need to believe? Wait, nuclear's bad. Okay, it's bad. Let's get rid of nuclear because everyone said it's bad. And now a huge energy crisis just around the corner. I want to make the point, unless you've got a nuclear power plant on a f***ing volcano, things should be fine. Obviously, there's other situations as well. The point, if you build nuclear power plants in areas that don't have extreme natural disasters, it's incredibly reliable, incredibly efficient source of energy. But that goes against the mainstream narrative. People freak the f*** out about the very term, oh my god, nuclear, what? I'm scared, without thinking. If you really want to do your homework, learn about the derailment of progress in propulsion in spacecraft as a direct result of people freaking out about the very word nuclear. So if you need, if, if you really want to fight climate change and you want to do it with zero carbon emission, reliable energy, nuclear is the only answer. So let's expand on this because a lot of people will misinterpret these comments because thinking hurts, so why bother? Right at this point in time, he has a fairly reasonable point. However, there is a very clear path to a global economy that is almost entirely solar and or wind slash hydro powered energy stored in batteries, problem solved. But at this point in time, we do not have the capacity to make the batteries, to make the solar, something needs to fill in that gap as we transition to a fully sustainable, mostly solar powered battery storage economy. The major mistake, the major mistake a lot of countries, governments, and sheeple around the earth have made is to think, huh, fossil fuel's bad, nuclear bad, solar good, wind good, hydro good. Oh, let's just get rid of all the things that are bad right now, even if we're currently reliant on them and that'll f everything up. 
cause major security problems because of energy dependence and cause people to potentially freeze, have businesses shut down because restaurants can't afford the cost to operate their ovens and stoves. Nothing could possibly go wrong. I'm a good person because I don't support nuclear fossil fuel. Oh, is there an emoji for that? Can somebody show me where the, where's the emoji to show everybody that I don't support the energy sources that other people don't support? I need to put that in my Twitter profile so everyone knows I'm a good person. So while, you know, we believe you're going to see fundamental improvement this year. We already start. We think you're starting to see that. I think there's going to be a huge sentiment shift this winter as energy energy costs skyrocket and politicians look to real solutions to fight climate change. Solar and wind are not real solutions. The nuance really matters here. Right now, what Gordon is suggesting is that solar and wind aren't a viable solution to transition the entire global economy immediately to sustainable energy. And that's right. We're not there yet. We do need to use these interim energy sources before we get there. Many people have their heads so far up their own virtue signaling asses that they can't see this. These are the same kind of fools. We would have governments impose laws and restrictions in the third world preventing people from using fossil fuels to actually get by to cover their basic needs. These same fools, of course, would rather these people die, starve to death, and fail to pull themselves out of poverty than dare to burn any fossil fuels. It's important to understand. We need more solar. We need more batteries. In particular, we need more batteries. You fast forward a few decades into the future, the vast majority of all energy on Earth will be solar, wind, hydro, and stored in batteries. But we're not there yet. It's a gradual process, step by step, transitioning from the dirtiest forms of fuel first, e.g. coal pika plants and so on, moving more and more progressively towards less polluting, less harmful energy sources, then eventually to an entirely sustainable economy. And you're seeing that with, re with respect to Russia invading the Ukraine because the EU became reliant on uh, Russia for power because, you know, they became over-reliant for them on fossil fuel energy. And I think you're going to see it this summer as energy costs skyrocket in the U.S. And unfortunately, people potentially uh, freeze to death in the European Union. All right. Now, I got to say that I completely agree with that outlook. You know, a lot of people sometimes try Come to on, man, you disagree with me. No, <laughs> no, normally. So was that a little bit of lighthearted banter or possibly a window and insight into the inner workings of the mind of Mr. GLJ? himself. I have mentioned something about a fetish in the past. Let's move on. That's what I was going to say. Normally, you know, everyone wants to try to hit you for your Tesla outlook, but I feel like in this case, you're dead on, Gordon. Listen, Kathy Wood has been among the biggest destroyers of capital we've ever seen. Um, you know, why she continues to get airtime, it's not up to me to say, but I think, you know, she needs to start being asked real hard, tough questions. I mean, you know, she said, you know, her her entire thesis on Tesla years ago, and I'll admit she was right on the stock price, but her entire thesis fundamentally was robo taxis and they've done nothing there. She's been 100% incorrect. Definitely have to disagree on this for a couple of reasons. First of all, Tesla's made stunning progress. Most people who are regular viewers of this channel will know my thoughts. They have an unassailable lead. They're late on the timing, but when you're doing something that's never been done before, you expect it to be on time every time. Come on. To Gordon's point, around Kathy Wood and Ark Invest being dead wrong about RoboTaxi. Pretty sure the stock market is assigning some value to RoboTaxi in Tesla's current market cap. Exactly how much, it's hard to know. But if there was no FSD, no autopilot, no progress in this area at all, I have a funny feeling Tesla stock would be nowhere near its current levels. But in fairness to Gordon, huge part of Ark's thesis was RoboTaxi. They were too optimistic on the timing. I mean, it seems like Elon, Ark and myself all suffer from severe optimism bias. I mean, I've got to own that. But I think Gordon is missing the point here. The stonk market knows, at least in part, that Tesla has a huge lead in terms of autonomy and he's assigning some significant value. And I think that the media needs to start asking her hard questions. Um, and, 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 and that's not just, that's just not happening. Speaking of hard questions being asked of folks who've been wrong over a period of time relating to particular stocks, I mean, I believe the first appearance of Gordon Johnson in the mainstream finance media that I'm aware of was back in 2013, when he was saying that there was no way Tesla could eke out any cost advantages and drive the cost of their laptop batteries they were putting in their cars down any further. They'd never released their mass market vehicle. Tesla stock was massively overvalued again back in 2013, about a decade ago. And Gordon's been super wrong on Tesla stock for literally a decade running. So it is worth asking Gordon the hard questions. Why is it, Mr. Johnson, that you've been so wrong for so long in the same direction the entire time? Not once have you become more bullish on the stock price. I thought, oh, you know what? It's actually reasonable value here. These are questions that must be asked. So she continues to get AUM. Um, and unfortunately for those investing with her, you know, the, the facts are this year she continues to destroy it. This isn't me coming down on Kathy Wood. 
Um, this is just me stating facts um, uh, uh, or, you know, what's happened with her funds. So, look, I, I don't know what's going to happen going forward. You know, if the Fed pivots, I think she'll be fine. I think we'll go back to this, you know, crazy money printing um, uh, uh, environment where money losing stocks are the ones to own. So a couple of things here. I do believe that the Fed is going to be massively reversing course a lot sooner than people expect. Maybe we shouldn't have raised rates so aggressively, so consistently looking at trailing 12 month data. That was dumb. Which is likely to help growth stocks. ARK Invest's bread and butter. It's important to understand too. ARK Invest have a publicly stated investment time horizon of five years. So it is unfair to judge them on a window of time any shorter than five years. This strategy, investing in innovation, growth companies, is destined, it's bound to be more volatile than any other investing strategy. It's very easy for people to kick ARK Invest while they're down, but you have to be looking over a five year time horizon. Just imagine owning Tesla stock in 2014. Five years later in 2019, you could pick up Tesla stock less than you were paying five years earlier. Does that mean your thesis on Tesla was wrong or that the stock market was wrong for literally five years, half a decade? I would suggest the latter. Tesla just unveiled a look at the Tesla bot on their recent AI day, could this really kind of distract from Tesla's main business and be more of a distraction than a help to the main business? Listen, there was, a, I want to read my notes here. There was a uh, robotics engineer who was quoted um, in the Associated Press. He said the, the AI day from Tesla was, quote, a scam. And, and let me tell you what he said. I think this is very important for people to understand. By the way, just want to point out the strategy here. 10 out of 10 stuff. You can say something without saying it. How? Quote a supposed expert who, for all I know, could be somebody living in their mum's basement, claiming to be an expert, like many of the Tesla Q geniuses reacting to Tesla AI Day on my own Twitter feed. You can now quote this expert who describes Tesla's AI Day, which obviously includes the Tesla humanoid robot, as, quote, a scam, suggesting the entire thing was a scam without you personally having said it was a scam. Well played, Gordon. One thing I want to mention, a year ago in August at AI Day number two, Elon Musk said, his words were, in a year, we're going to have robots capable of doing, doing human tasks, right? So at AI Day last, you know, this past Friday, he should have unveiled a robot capable of doing human tasks. He said, we're not even going to start taking orders for three to five years. So this is another over-promise, under-deliver, or what some would say, quite frankly, lie. I'm not saying he's lying, but if someone continuously overpromises and under delivers, what do you call it? Once again, props to the technique here. Some would say a lie. I'm not saying a lie, but, but some would say a lie. That's how you say something without saying it. Some would say Gordon Johnson is an idiot. Some would say he's an oil shill. Some would say, but of course I'm not saying, and by the way, I'm not actually saying anything because I don't, still don't understand this guy. I don't know what his deal is. Humiliation fetish, just trying to prey on the mentally deluded Tesla Q virgins, selling research to them. It is a strategy. There's a lot of people desperate and thirsty for some proof that Elon's a fraud. Why not start up a legitimate research firm and sell them that so-called research? Of course, again, no accusations here, but some might say that some of those things might be true. But I'm not saying that. I want to say what this, um, this engineer said. He said, on the bots, anyone in the industry will tell you the real elephant in the room is that for these bots to be of any use, they need to be equipped with perception and mobility. And that is what we currently don't know how to do. Yes, you can get basic navigation on a flat floor, basic vision, but, um, but that is nowhere near even the dexterity of a spider and not even close to any higher animal. We just simply don't know how to do it. It's often called Morbeke's Paradox that we make machines with high cognitive tasks, but have very big issues truing them to make them understand basic stuff. He says, this was observed 30 years ago, and despite massive progress in the field of computing, really hasn't changed much. So in summary, they have a very bold claim, this is Tesla, and bold claims require extraordinary evidence. What they've shown was a lame robotic demo, and they bragged about solving what everyone in the field already solved years ago, and didn't mention a word about any actual progress and solving the stuff nobody solved yet. So to your question, I, I think it is a distraction, but I think that it's 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 the wrong kind of distraction. If you talk to anybody in the robotics engineering field, I think they'll tell you as much. Now let's get into the main business of Tesla, right? Tesla just missed on deliveries, even though it seemed like Elon was calling for all employees to help. And is this a trend that we're likely to see continue? I think so, listen. He said it's logistics, and some people have accused Elon Musk of being a pathological liar. I'm not going to accuse him of that. There it is again. 
Some have accused Elon Musk of being a pathological liar. I'm not gonna say that because I said some have already said that, so I don't need to say that myself. Well played, Gordon. But for him to say logistics is absurd in our view. Let me tell you why. Before the quarter ended, you could order a car in China and get it in one week. You could order a car in the US and get it in roughly four to six weeks. You could order a car in Europe and get it in the same amount of time. Now, I'm not here to make fun of people who suffer from premature conclusion jumping, but I think we just saw some premature conclusion jumping all over oneself. The fact that toward the end of the quarter, wait times for some vehicles in China were relatively short, this doesn't tell us anything. There's so many possible explanations for this. Like, here's one of them. Tesla began the quarter exporting deliveries from their main export hub in China to other places, other countries overseas. Because, you know, boats take a long time to get there, so if you want them delivered that quarter, you send them early in the quarter. Then you switch to local delivery toward the end of the quarter. In addition, there's incentives. I've covered this in recent videos. Tesla has a delicate situation here. Model 3 currently not eligible for set incentives. If they lower the prices a little bit, they will be. A lot of consumers possibly waiting to take orders, hoping for a price decline, hoping to be eligible for certain incentives. I mean, this makes sense, but let me just explain this from another angle. Because again, we don't want to be prematurely conclusioning all over ourselves. China, the gigafactory in Shanghai, is the main export hub globally for Tesla. For example, my home country of Australia. Model Y deliveries have recently commenced. The Model Ys being delivered to Australia are coming from China. Think about this for a moment. The wait times on deliveries produced in China, in China, are not directly tied to the total output of the Chinese factory. In fact, let's make this point a little bit clearer, because again, we don't want a prematurely conclusion all over ourselves. On screen now, the Model Y wait times for an order made today in Australia for a Model Y which is produced in China, estimated delivery time, somewhere between April 2023 and June 2023. We're looking at six plus months. This for Model Y performance. Model 3. Rear wheel drive, order today in Australia. And how long do you have to wait for your made in Shanghai Model 3? You'll be waiting until February to May, 2023. Four and a half to six plus months. Model Y rear wheel drive, same delivery window. February, 2023 to May, 2023. So let's walk through this logically. If somebody today in Australia is ordering a vehicle from Tesla that's coming from the Chinese factory and they're having to wait four and a half, five and a half, six plus months to take delivery of said vehicle, would that not suggest that Tesla actually has demand far in excess of what they're able to meet currently from their main export hub? And would that not give us reason to think, hmm, is it possible that Tesla are prioritizing certain orders and certain deliveries to certain regions, being strategic with their logistics, strategic with the timing of their deliveries? Huh, a little bit less demand in China at the moment because of this incentive, people waiting for a price drop. So why don't we send some more vehicles to Australia or New Zealand? Or Timbuk fucking too. If wait times for all Tesla vehicles in all regions globally were the same and there are one month, this would paint a different picture. But one final point on Tesla's wait times, their order backlog. It appears that Tesla's order backlog is currently declining. Now, some might say this is demand collapsing. <laughs> Others might go, oh, hang on a minute. Is it possible that Tesla's finally starting to solve this massive fucking problem of customers having to wait six plus months to take delivery of their vehicles? Because uh, ladies and gentlemen, spoiler alert, Tesla doesn't want their wait times to be so significant. They don't want their order backlog to be many hundreds of thousands of vehicles. You understand, right? It's a bad customer experience. Over time, Tesla's ramping up production. Their goal will be to drive down their order backlog as much as possible. So I personally expect we're actually going to see a massive decline in Tesla's order backlog in the coming quarters. They don't want customers waiting obscene amounts of time. This is part of the reason why they're ramping up production. We've got Austin, Berlin, Fremont, and Shanghai all increasing production capacity and output. So I expect the Tesla bears to continue to cite this. Oh, Tesla's order backlog's collapsing. The wait time in this particular tiny region is really short. Oh my God, there's no demand. And I'm gonna to continue to point out that Tesla will sell every vehicle they make for years to come. You can count on it. There was no logistics issues. In fact, if you go back to 2018, when they missed deliveries, he used the same excuse, right? Just Google search 2018 Tesla logistics issues. The story will pop up. But he said at the time they fixed it with a bunch of trucks. Here's the problem, right? Their deliveries in Q1, were 310,000, right? Dropped to 254,000 in Q2, right? That's a $55,000 or 55,000 unit shortfall. Why? Because their Shanghai plant was down. If you go back to Q2, people at Tesla, everybody in the industry was saying they're gonna fully make it up in Q3, right? But they only did 340, right? So you had a 55,000 car shortfall, right? So, if you, so that shifted, that was backlog that shifted to Q3. So the 340 number is really 340 minus 55 because that's backlog from Q2 that shifted to Q3. So really they're at a run rate that is below the record number they did in Q1. 
This is a big problem for Tesla. Why? Because Tesla is trading at 50 times their earnings. When the auto industry trades on average at five times, that means that investors expect Tesla to pay them 100% of their earnings this year as a dividend for the next 50 years. That's what a 50 times multiple means. So if they're not growing, the stock is grossly overvalued. Don't want to spend too much time on the absurdity here, but just a couple of quick things. Gordon Johnson suggesting Elon Tesla used the excuse of logistics challenges back in 2018 for not managing as many deliveries as were expected, claiming that was an excuse. Yet a few years later, Tesla delivering many multiples more vehicles per quarter have shown stunning growth. And now Johnson once again attempting to suggest that Tesla are hiding behind a lie of logistics challenges for why there was a few less deliveries than expected this quarter, despite Tesla signaling ahead of this quarter, we're gonna stop going for that massive wave end of quarter delivery push because it costs us too much expedited shipping at the end of the quarter. There's no point paying a few hundred dollars extra to expedite delivery of a vehicle to a customer anymore because we've reached a reasonable enough scale that a delivery's miss doesn't fucking matter. Talk about an own goal from Gordon here. He's suggesting back in 2018, Tesla was hiding behind no demand by saying, oh, logistics. It's not that there's no demand, it's just logistics. And trying to make the same argument now, despite the fact that we've seen insane delivery growth in that period of time. Again, implying that there's a demand issue and that's why Tesla failed to meet the Wall Street expectations rather than Tesla having a few extra vehicles currently being shipped, still not having arrived in customers' hands. Just bizarre, so logically inconsistent. Listen, I, I wanna highlight something. Tesla right now has basically flatlined at 1.3 million cars, EV cars, $66,000 EV cars sold annually. That's right, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, according to GLJ himself, Tesla vehicle deliveries have plateaued at about 1.3 million annually. How well will these comments age? Not very. Let me know in the comments below. You think Tesla will sell more than 1.3 million vehicles next year? And more than that the following year? And more than that the following year? Or is it just me? Which, by the way, is impressive. That is impressive. But here's the problem. It's impressive for BMW that sells 2 million cars a year, right? High-end luxury cars. But BMW is valued at $45 billion, not $800 billion. So it is impressive what Tesla has achieved, but the valuation is ridiculous. So a $45 billion valuation for Tesla is a $15 stock price. Did he just suggest Tesla's a $15 stock? Not a $300 stock price. So when you, when you consider all that, you consider the issues with Elon Musk saying things that aren't true. Um, you consider the fact that lead times have collapsed. We're looking at lead times um, in a backlog that is effectively equal to their production. And by the way, their production is being intentionally kept low, right? The, the Shanghai factory is running at roughly 90% capacity. Texas and Berlin are running at 10% capacity. Despite that fact, they're not even able to sell all those cars. Can't go that far off the deep end. Sometimes I almost think you're actually serious about what you say and then you come up with a doozy like that. Suggesting that Tesla's intentionally running their factories below their maximum capacity. Citing examples of Berlin and Austin at 10% of their capacity. Bro, they're fucking ramping up. One was a fucking forest two years ago and the other one was a field of dirt two years ago. And to imply that Shanghai isn't maxing out capacity, running at 90%. For those that don't know, total production capacity annually is a figure based on constant, non-stop output with no maintenance, no upgrades, no downtime, no repairs, no fascist shutdowns, nothing. It's literally impossible to be running at 100% of your annual capacity. It's not possible. Shanghai is effectively maxed out and Austin and Berlin are ramping up. This is just so nonsensical. The guy loses all credibility with these kind of arguments. You know, some of the cherry picking points might almost kind of make sense in a weird way, but this is just ridiculous, bro. Seems like in the world of GLJ research, ramping up a brand new factory is intentionally running said factory below its maximum capacity. I mean, there's people out there who are saying they're gonna sell 20 million cars by 2030. That will require them to build a new $500,000 plant every single quarter, fully sold out, starting two quarters ago. It's clearly absurd. Anyone who believes that, for lack of a better word, um, I don't wanna, but it, that's just absurd, so. Oh, come on, Gordon. Don't be so polite, just say what you really think. I can handle it. Dumbass, deluded, moron, dipshit, brain dead. I can take it. Please, don't hold back. I think the reality is setting in. Tesla's market share has collapsed in the US, it has collapsed in China, it's collapsed in Europe. And I think the competition is killing them. Look. How can anyone take this guy seriously? The competition is killing Tesla. No, 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 Gordon, you're killing me. I want to use an analogy. I think the, the right analogy for Tesla is, it's, I'm going to look at my notes. It's the net, net, next Netflix, right? Um, so the way that I want to explain this is, you know, um, 
We believe, you know, so so what, what do we mean? So for years, Netflix had an absurd valuation based on pioneering, um, based on the pioneering position in the streaming media. But once it was proven that such a market existed, a myriad of competitors swarmed all over it, right? And mm -hmm. this year, Netflix stock collapsed. And we learned that not only is Netflix no longer hyper growth, um, but for the first time since 2011, um, it actually lost subscribers. So let me get this straight. Mass producing an extremely complicated high volume product and shipping it to consumers around the world is comparable to sending bits of data over the internet and maybe creating your own content. So, you know, I, I believe Net Tesla is similar. What I mean by that is you have VW, Hyundai, Kia, Ford, GM, Stellantis, BMW, Mercedes, BYD, and other Chinese competition and, a few, and in a few years, Toyota and Honda being the Disney, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Peacock, Hulu, Paramount Plus, etc., of the electric car market, stealing Tesla's share and eventually pounding its stock down 95% or so from today's levels into the valuation of just another car company. Once again, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, Tesla stock to crash 95% in the coming years due to the competition. I think we're in the beginning innings of that happening. You have sell side analysts saying things that in my view are ridiculous. There is no logistics issue, logistics issue based on the lead times. He used that same excuse in 2018. He said it was fixed. So this is a really crazy out there idea, but just play along at home, folks. If Tesla fixed a logistics issue they were having in 2018, a one-off issue that temporarily caused some issues getting all the vehicles they'd produced to customers that quarter, that doesn't mean that it's impossible for Tesla at any point in the future to ever have another logistics issue ever, especially given the fact that they've massively scaled up their production since that point in time. It's absurd to even suggest this. I just, come on, Gordon, please, my man. You've got to give me something better to work with here. This is just embarrassing. And I think you're going to see even tougher results for them um, in the fourth quarter. We could talk about Twitter if you want, but that's another dynamic. Yeah, that's another dynamic. I, I'm still on Tesla here. Now, one thing that you just stated, comparing them to Netflix. Now, one thing that I would say is maybe Netflix has their ad tier that's coming on out, but Tesla has two products, right? The semi truck and the cyber truck to be released next year. How do you feel about Tesla next year? Do you feel that they could actually have a down year, even though they're releasing two products like this? Yeah, so I don't believe the semi-truck will ever be released because I don't believe that batteries, just think about this, right? If you just look at the Ford, uh, the, the, the F-150 Lightning, look at the range without towing and the range with towing. Like any, if you ask somebody in the semi industry, right? Think about this, how long it takes to actually charge those batteries. My dad used to be a truck driver. Like it just doesn't, it never made sense. There, there's gonna be no Tesla semi-truck with lithium ion batteries. The technology just doesn't make sense. The, the price point would be way above what Tesla said. With respect to the Cybertruck, I think the price point is going to be egregiously high. And that market is already saturated with the Ford F-150, the Silverado Lightning, you got the Hummer EV. I mean, they're going to be last to market with the product that, in our view, is inferior. So I don't think those products are coming, but I think that's the genius, if you will, of Musk. He always has something further down the line that, oh, if the car company is struggling or if the valuation doesn't make sense, give us credit for this. Look. This is a car company. 95% of their revenue comes from selling cars. The other 5% comes from an energy division that has negative gross margins. So to say this isn't a car company is ridiculous. And people say, well, no, it's a software company. That's also ludicrous. He's right, it's true. I mean, Tesla has absolutely no software expertise whatsoever. If you disagree, you're obviously just an Elon D rider. We haven't seen any examples of Tesla doing anything in terms of software that other car companies can't also do. So he's totally right. They're just a car company. They should be valued like one too, and not just valued like one, but valued like one that isn't actually growing at all, and also isn't industry leading in terms of profit margins or wait times for their compelling products, who also doesn't need to advertise because their products are so good they sell themselves, and who've also never been able to produce enough vehicles to meet underlying demand. Got me there, Gordon. Good one. They're dead last based on navigant consulting and full self-driving, autonomous technology. They report level two to California. That's what their lawyers say. There's other guys that are at level four and arguably level five. There's guys with robo taxis, Wamo, um, Cruise, et cetera, on the road right now. Tesla does not have that. So they don't lead in uh, technology. They lag, they're very last. And with respect to their batteries, you know, everything they said at battery day was a sham pretty much. The longer this goes on, the more absurd Gordon's points. Tesla doesn't lead in technology. Everything they said at battery day was a sham-ish kind of, oh, I better not say that quite out loud and rewind that comment just a little bit there. Again, say something without saying it. For those who don't know, just over two years ago, Tesla holds their battery investor day. 
They unveil plans for a new battery form factor, the 4680 cell, an entirely new manufacturing process. Say we're still working on it, a few things to iron out, but this is our plan. We intend on putting these in vehicles as soon as we possibly can. Fast forward two years and there are vehicles driving around on roads today purchased by customers of Tesla, made by Tesla, in a Tesla factory featuring Tesla made 4680 battery cells are a sham. It is impossible to take this guy seriously. Um, and we can talk about it if you want, it, that if you want, but it's like they do these days to pump these products that never come to fruition. Um, and, and you know, their car sales, they haven't grown in three quarters. I think Q4 is going to be down versus um, a Q3. Um, and you, you know, I think you're going to minus margin, you know, margin debilitating price cuts. Um, and I think that's becoming clear to everyone. Well, we're on the line here with Gordon Johnson. Thank you for staying a little extra. I got a couple more to get through here and then we'll get you on out of here, Gordon. Appreciate you sticking a little bit extra. Now, one of the recent tweets that caught my eyes and I know it probably caught your eyes was Elon about the cyber truck and how it, it would be waterproof enough to serve briefly as a boat so it could cross <laughs> rivers lakes and even seas uh that aren't being too choppy of course this came out during the hurricane i don't know how much uh elon or uh, tesla has been known about uh, being marine technology but what do you yeah. feel about this was this another exaggeration from elon i mean you could call it an exaggeration you could call it a lie i mean however you but here's the facts right you put a lithium-ion battery in water and typically um there's not the good results that it erupts <laughs> into fire so yeah. to recommend this, I think is it's not just in my view absurd, uh, but it's potentially dangerous. Um, so you know he said this about the Model Three cars, um, and you know you had issues with you know running these things through car washes where you know the cars would leak and you know parts would fall off. So the idea that these cars can uh, act as boats, uh, I, I, it's just I mean it's absurd. I mean it's. It, and, and again, absurd and dangerous. Now let's go towards FSD. Now, of course, there's been some recent development. Will Tesla ever get this project finished? Yeah, look, I think FSD is among the biggest deceptions slash, um, I don't want to, I don't know, one of the biggest deceptions in corporate history. I think Gordon was about to say the F word and then thought better of it. I think it's been a massive failure on behalf of the NHTSA. Uh, the National Highway Transport and Safety um, Association. I think it's been a huge disaster on the part of the NTSB. They've made recommendations that haven't been followed. And you go to teslades.com um, and it's been alleged that, you know, I think it's like 19 people have been confirmed or um, you know, to, to have been killed associated with, um, you know, uh, Tesla's autopilot technology. Um, that's uh, teslades.com, that's what they allege. Um, look, they use cameras. Right. The people who have robo taxis on the road use cameras and LIDAR and radar. Tesla uses cameras. That technology um, from the experts in the industry does not work and will never work. And if you look at the Hulu special that was done around the 2016 Paint It Black video, which, by the way, Tesla still has on its website where it says in bold words, the car is driving itself. The driver is only there for legal purposes. You know, that was a three minute video. We later found out that. There were mass, that video was taped over 500 miles. There were multiple um, disengagements. Um, that's extremely deceptive. But, you know, you watch that video and you think, man, these cars can drive themselves. You know, I, I, I need to drive home from a bar. I'll let the car drive me home. And next thing you know, uh, potentially you're in an accident where you potentially end up in a fatal accident. Uh, look, I don't know how this ends because I, I believe our, our working assumption is that Tesla is above all laws. And it looks like the Twitter, Elon Musk agreed today to buy Twitter. It seems like maybe he's not above all laws. But our working assumption is he's above all laws. NHTSA will never do anything and they can do whatever they want. But the reality is their competitors have robo taxis on the road and report their miles to the California DMV because they're above level two. Tesla does not have one robo taxi on the road, despite the fact, by the way, that he promised a million by 20, what was it, 2020, and he used that promise to raise over a billion dollars, which that promise was completely false. Um, you know, uh, But they have zero robo taxes on the road and they don't report their miles to the DMV because they're level two. So it's just facts. I mean, some of this stuff is so egregiously absurd. It's like, it's hard to understand given how highly this company is valued, but that's why we're so excited about this short. Last one here, Inflation Reduction Act and EV credits. How does that play into Tesla's strategy moving forward? Yeah, so everybody assumes that all of their cars are going to get those credits. Right now, the batteries for the Model 3 
um, uh, the content and the batteries are made in China. Based on that dynamic, they would get none of that credit. Uh, and with respect to the Model Y, I assume they'll get the credit, but does it classify as an SUV, number one? And how much of the content is made in China, which is one of the key metrics as to how much money of the Inflation Reduction Act you're going to get. So I still think there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, but at the end of the day, if we're entering into a global recession, you know, I just don't think that the demand, you know, for $60,000 and above cars is going to be there. Historically, historically, that 60000 that luxury market, the biggest market share any automaker has ever gained is 15%. And then it stops. And Tesla is right at that 15% level. So I just think they've reached their maximum of about 1.3 1.3 million um, uh, units of demand for their cars. And I think as consensus realizes that, those massive multiples they're being valued at versus their peers are going to come down. So I think the stock's going to come, come under tremendous pressure. A word of advice, Gordon? Probably worth taking some time to work on your material and come up with some new arguments that aren't as ridiculous, as absurd, as ludicrous. The stunning thing is there are actually people out there who hear these comments from Gordon and think he makes sense that he believes what he's saying and that he has a good point. It's very hard to get through to these people, unfortunately. By the way, guys, a quick bit of housekeeping. For those who don't know, I've been posting a ton of exclusive content on Patreon recently, as well as loads of tweets. I made a mistake in yesterday's video and actually edited the thing down. I didn't want it to be too long. I cut out some super important context and I kind of forgot that people aren't reading all my tweets and checking out all the Patreon videos. So just to be clear, if you're not watching every single video I post here on YouTube and everything on Patreon and reading all my tweets, you will occasionally miss very important context. And on that subject, regarding Elon Musk's Twitter acquisition, I had a few comments yesterday. I'm not going to bother responding to them individually, but it's important to clear this up. From the outset, I've been saying that Elon Musk was intent on closing this Twitter deal. The lowest probability I sign on this deal closing was 80%. Feel free to fact check me. As things progressed, this became higher and higher and higher. I explained what Elon Musk was trying to do, why this was headed to court, why there was a trial, what Elon Musk needed to see, aka Twitter substantiating bot claims, Elon not wanting to get fucked in the ass while purchasing the company, but still wanting to follow through with the transaction. I was completely wrong about Elon Musk negotiating the price down on Twitter. Not wrong that Elon was negotiating on price, but wrong that the deal would eventually close at a price lower than the originally agreed upon amount following negotiations. Something changed. My reasoning still stands, and I'll share a tweet I posted yesterday that a lot of people missed. There was also a video on Patreon specifically, did this push Elon Musk over the edge? relating to the Twitter purchase. My primary thesis was that this deal would close, which went against the mainstream narrative. Everyone saying, Elon thinks he's paid too much. He wants out of the deal. He's overpaying the stock market crash. He doesn't want to buy it. He's trying to get out of the deal. On this, everyone was wrong and I was right. That was a point that I was making. And again, totally my fault. I literally cut out like a six minute segment from yesterday's video, which laid that groundwork. I'm an idiot. I just tried to edit things down and kind of forgot that that was really important context. But just to be super clear, a few people yesterday thought I was taking credit for predicting the final closing price of this deal. Now look, I was right, everyone else was wrong. <laughs> that was not the point. What I was right about was how things would play out, not the incidental detail of the actual transaction price, but whether or not Elon Musk actually wanted to close the deal and would close the deal. Here's a couple of tweets from a thread I posted on September 19th. Elon Musk is not trying to negotiate a cheaper price or get out of the deal because he's changed his mind or because the stonk market tanked or because he likes shenanigans. Important to understand, on September 19th, Elon Musk is not trying to negotiate a cheaper price or get out of the deal because he's changed his mind, blah, 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 blah. He's trying not to get fucked in the ass while doing something extremely important. It's that simple. This is the prediction. Let's scroll up and see some of the earlier tweets in this thread. One, Elon wants this deal to close. He just doesn't want to get fucked over. Two, Elon is not one to play games. His online troll persona is not a barometer for how seriously he takes serious matters. And three, Twitter has not satisfactorily substantiate their bot slash MDAO claims to Elon Musk. All Twitter need do to substantiate bot numbers and MDAOs filed with SEC is one, here's the data we used, two, here's the method we used, and three, here's the result. If all three check out, the deal closes. And it should go without saying, but I'm not gonna make assumptions here. The deal closes means the deal closes at the originally agreed upon price. Because if Twitter can substantiate the bot claims, then Elon goes, yeah, great, I'm getting what I thought I was buying, let's do the deal at the original price. This would not be in court had Twitter satisfactorily provided all three to Elon Musk. Now let's fast forward to a more recent tweet. I posted this yesterday. Some people asking, well, what happened? Why'd the deal close? Why isn't Elon Musk negotiating the price down any further? Per my tweet, Musk held reasonable doubt regarding the accuracy of the disclosed bot numbers. Either Twitter or Musk substantiated the bot claims. E.g. Twitter proved how they were getting to the bot numbers or Elon Musk saw the data his team looked at and go, you know what, the estimates are actually accurate. Or Musk's lawyers advised him to just buy. Reasonable probability he loses the case. Not gonna end well, just buy the fucking thing, Elon. Or, and this is my assumption, 
Musk decided it is too important not to buy Twitter, even if he gets f***ed in the ass due to high bot numbers. I suspect it's the latter. And again, I did post a Patreon video, an exclusive explaining exactly what I thought had happened. Literally, did this just push Elon Musk over the edge? So my bad for not communicating super clearly about what I was taking credit for in terms of the prediction panning out. And again, I do want to emphasize, if you're not following me on Twitter and reading all the tweets, if you're not watching every single daily video here on YouTube, and if you're not watching every single video on Patreon, there'll be things that you're missing. I'm not saying you have to go sign up to Patreon and follow me on Twitter, I'm just pointing out my thoughts. My current mindset, the ideas, my position is constantly evolving and changing over time. It's like a fluid stream of consciousness. And so as things change and update, I might tweet here, I might post a Patreon exclusive video filling in some of the voids. I go, hang on a minute, something's changed here. This is a little bit different now, clarifying things and so on. I know this was a very long bit of housekeeping, but I needed to put that on the record there just so you guys understand. And while we're on the topic of Patreon in particular, I've just recently posted a reaction video to a previous Tesla bull who currently has a $140 per share price target on Tesla's stock. You wanna see that? You'll have to head over to Patreon. You can do so using the card in the corner or the link in the pinned comment. You'll gain access to well over 100 other exclusive videos, loads of content and perks, plus up-to-date access to my Tesla stock price targets. So, see you over on Patreon. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan, this is Solving the Money Problem, and I love you all. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you wanna support the channel and instantly unlock over 100 exclusive videos, plus my 10-year Tesla stock price targets and loads of other perks, including optional access to my Tesla valuation model, join our growing community of thousands of supporters on Patreon with the link in the pinned comment. You can also pick up some Tesla, Elon, and investment theme merch in the merch store. And if you're still watching, you're awesome. Please let me know your thoughts on today's video in the comments below and click the card on screen now to watch the next video.